You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. One of the people that I had the pleasure of meeting through doing Addressing Gettysburg or, or from doing Addressing Gettysburg is Dr. Peter Carmichael. He's the uh, head of the Civil War Institute over at Gettysburg College. And, you know, I've seen him on TV long before I uh, ever met him. And so it was it was great to meet him. And, uh, you know, he's a very nice guy. He's very down to earth, very helpful. And you could tell that he just loves this stuff. And so uh, he has a book that came out called uh, The War for the Common Soldier, How Men Thought, Fought, and Survived in Civil War Armies. And he came on. We wanted to talk about that. And so Bob and I sat down with him over at the old studio at uh, Destination Gettysburg at the old radio station and just talked about what life was like for the common soldier. And I loved it. It was great. And he was uh, very helpful afterwards. Uh, he, he put us in touch with his uh, publisher, and we've had a few of uh, the authors on that we've got books from, and we're actually trying to get the remainder of the authors that we uh, received books from, and uh, we're trying to get them for this winter uh, to come on and talk about their books. So anyway, Peter comes on, talks about the War for the Common Soldier, and... This is it. He's a very interesting guy. If you ever get a chance to go and hear him talk or if you ever bump into him around town or anything like that, go uh, say hello to him. And I think you'll uh, I think you'll enjoy uh, a little conversation with him. Um, so I hope you enjoy this conversation that Bob and I had with him on the seven days of Christmas with Addressing Gettysburg. This is available over at our Patreon uh uh, account, but you're, of course you're getting it for free now, so you don't need to go over there to hear this, but there is plenty more where this came from. Fascinating people just sitting down and talking with us, and uh, I think you'll like it if you join. So, with no, with, 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 without further delay, Peter Carmichael. Right. So you you know, and I can work this. on this stuff. Right. And in, in exchange, I'm going to give you a deeper education. I'm going to interview right. experts right. about all different aspects, as long as I can tie it into Gettysburg, Gettysburg yeah. somehow. Yeah. And so there's plenty of Gettysburg. In fact, a criticism of my book is that there's too much Eastern theater and not enough West. And I said, Earl Hess, he's a good friend of mine, said that. I said, Earl, I said, the cover of the book is an Indian regiment, by the way, an Indian regiment in Tennessee at Duck River. I said, come on, man. That doesn't that <laughs> yeah. count for something. Do, like, do, no. do, do, would, do, have you gotten a lot of criticism for it? Yeah, it's probably one part. I mean, it's, you know, it's, the book is still pretty fresh in terms of when reviews, but I mean, that's certainly one concern. But that happens all, with anything. Oh, You're yeah, going to get no, critics. Yeah, I don't. I, I, yeah. None of that stuff bothers me. Right. Right. I, I mean, I just got a really nice review out that, a person really understood the book, right? And that's what you really seek for. I mean, lavishing praise is whatever. But when someone really sort of gets what the idea is that you're trying to, to put forth, mm -hmm. you know, that's when it's gratifying and somewhat reassuring, right? right. <laughs> that you're just not <laughs> writing and it's just going nowhere, <laughs> which, I mean, we all need to be, I think, self-aware of the fact that we operate in pretty small ponds and yeah. these are just little ripples. Yeah. But, you know, I still, like we can talk about this, I still firmly believe that the value of what we do collectively here, I speak of all for all of us, is you know, we are recovering the voices of these men uh, who I think deserve to be heard. And, I agree. You know, so that's, yeah. You know, that's kind of the motivating yeah. force behind it. So, uh, well, we're, we're, yeah. we've already started. Yeah, whenever so yeah, let's, just, yeah. Let's, So let's here go. we are. Yeah. So uh, what, what, what was the, uh, the idea behind the book? What, what yeah. made you want to write right. this particular? Yeah. So uh, The War for the Common Soldier is part of the Littlefield series published by the University of North Carolina Press. It's a series that's dedicated to key issues or topics in the Civil War. And so the editors of the series, Gary Gallagher and Michael Parrish, Gallagher retired from University of Virginia. And Michael you Parrish is a Baylor. I studied, studied under Dr. Under Gallagher. Dr. Gallagher, yep. I studied under him. So they invited me to write the volume on The Common Soldier. So that's how it began nearly 10 years ago. And... What I was up against was an unusual challenge, and that's a field that is really fully matured, uh, that there's so much exciting and, and impressive scholarship on the life of the common soldier that I was having a hard time to, to find my place uh, uh, within this, this historiography. Mm -hmm. um, so it took a while, 
because I didn't want to write just another book about why men fought. And I'm not diminishing that question. I think it's an important one. But historians like James McPherson and Joe Glattar, Chandra Manning, Susanna Ural, there's a very long list. Mm. And they've all done impressive and important work. So I was assigned the task of writing a book that synthesized existing scholarship and create a new uh, argument or new interpretation. And uh, that's what I was up against. And it required that I become a very different historian. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was trained as a social historian, meaning that I was primarily interested in finding the letters of these men and recovering their lives as they lived it. Mm -hmm. And I know I needed to go a new direction, which meant that I had to become a cultural historian, which I think there's a key difference. And when a cultural historian, you're more concerned about getting into the inner world of these individuals, not just what they thought, but how they thought. Making that leap to how they thought, I left a lot of folks behind. (laughs) And we can talk about it. My editors were not particularly happy with this book in its first incarnation. Why is that? Um, Well, they thought that they thought that the case study approach that I took, so this book pivots around, I'd say, roughly 15 to 20 individuals. Okay. They're, they're deep contextual stories, they're narratives. And there was some question as to whether these individuals were representative of the common soldier. My argument to them is that there is no common soldier, and the search for one is an elusive one. It gets us really nowhere. I think rather we need to take men whose lives offer us an opportunity to not just explore how they thought, but to understand how they thought and acted within the broader cultural world that they breathed in, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, for many, that approach is an approach that um, seems too disconnected from the evidence itself, that that I'm too suggestive in places. You know, I will certainly live with that criticism. Too suggestive in what way? Well, that... um, For example, when you try to understand why a man deserted, Uh they often don't write it out in some grand proclamation. These are the the, reasons why, from number one being the most important to to number 10. They don't do that, right? So what you have to do then is you have to look at that context, and it has to be a very deep read. In that context, for example, the 3rd North Carolina, a soldier in that regiment, John Futch, F-U-T-C-H, mm-hmm. who fought right here at uh, Gettysburg. His brother died in his arms at Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. He spoke his letters. He's illiterate. He spoke those letters to a number of men. Many of them were barely literate themselves. By piecing those things together and by looking at other sources, I get a sense of that world that he inhabited that go beyond just his words. I have a sense of that that regiment in particular uh, suffered, I think, significantly from a logistical breakdown after Gettysburg. I also have some sense of the breakdown on the home front, which is absolutely critical Mm. to understanding all these men. Mm, The idea we can go to this battlefield and just talk about right flank and left flank and not think Mm. about the households where these men came is just, I think, a grievous mistake. I I agree. A grievous mistake. So that's how you start to piece these things together and to try to get at what I would say and this was my goal. I wanted the totality of the soldier experience, how they thought, how they felt, how they smelled, how they touched. Right? I mm. wanted all of that. Right. And that goes from the material things that they carried to the words that they wrote, to the reactions and relationships with their comrades as well as their loved ones. I wanted to try to do it all instead of a snap sh- snapshot approach. <laughs> I'll say that too quickly. Can I interject? Right. Yeah, please say I mean, Have your own opinions um, about this as well. Well, no, not, not at all. Yeah. In fact, um, <laughs> you you introduce us to Oliver Wendell Holmes. Of course, yeah. most of us know who that was. Yeah. And you end, in a sense, with Oliver yeah. Wendell. For Holmes. those who don't, who was Oliver? Wendell Holmes? Oliver Wendell Holmes was uh, in the Harvard Regiment. Yeah. He was Harvard educated. He interrupted his education. He became a soldier in the Twentieth Massachusetts, and um, he'll leave the service in 1864. And he'll go on to become Supreme Court Justice. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. he was a a, a, a legal what, what, a legal realist. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And he's that's going right. to change American jurisprudence yeah. in on the Supreme Court. And I'm wondering if you didn't purposely focus on him in the end of the book because he is an example 
of this bare knuckled pragmatism yeah, that's right. that you're writing about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a key theme that runs through the book is pragmatism. And I drew heavily from Louis Menon. I think that's how you pronounce his last mm-hmm. name. M-E- M-E-N-A-N-D, Menon, okay. who wrote Metaphysical Club. It's a brilliant piece of intellectual history. Uh, much of it I don't quite grasp. Some of it I do. <laughs> and the section on Oliver Wendell Holmes I drew from heavily. And I give Menon all the credit in the world. And, and what pragmatism simply is, is that men during the course of the war on both sides, they came to value an idea, not for its... Um, intrinsic value before its its practicality. Uh, Let me give you a quick example from Holmes and why, again, I relied on him. I think Menon thought that Holmes became less ideological. My point is that pragmatism actually allowed these men, in many cases, to hold on to their idealism. And so here's my example. Uh, After December 13th, those attacks against Maurice Heights at Mm -hmm. the Battle of Fredericksburg, in which Holmes was not able to be with his regiment, but he watched them. He watched them fight in the town of Fredericksburg and, of course, the assault against Marie Heights. He was very taken, very moved by it all. I think he even acknowledged that he shed a tear. And then his father, uh, who was, of course, no intellectual lightweight himself, wrote a letter to uh, Holmes after Fredericksburg, after this great cataclysmic defeat, and said, we will prevail, son, because our side has morality. We have God on our side. Our, our cause is the just cause. The rebel cause is not. And that's the reason why we'll prevail. Mm. But that just infuriated Oliver Wendell Holmes, who had just seen his buddies go to their death and go to, to, to their death in something that actually he almost admired. He did admire the professionalism of the men, their training, right? And learning from their mistakes. And so he wrote his father back chastised his father and said, this is absurd what you're saying. What's ultimately going to decide this thing is professionalism, practicality. It is adjusting to the circumstances as they present to us. Right. If we live by high ideas in some dogmatic way, we're all going to just go to our death here and for no good purpose in the end. So Holmes's example is a powerful one. And because Holmes writes so brilliantly yeah. and so openly, he was a perfect case study right, okay. to introduce at the beginning of the book, but certainly to close with. So well. c- can I just say, so, yeah, go right going ahead. back to your goal, I, I taught teenagers for 38 years, U.S. history. <laughs> God bless you. And, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, had I given the assignment to find out what was life like for the soldier of the Civil War. At first brush, I wouldn't give your book. At at a certain level of creature comforts, I would go to a veteran like uh, John Billings, Hardtack and Coffee. Coffee. That's right. If they wanted to get deeper to the causes, well, let's go to McPherson, you know, James McPherson for the audience. But boy, after this, I think you get all of it and another level here. And so let me sort of compliment you by paraphrasing Oliver Wendell Holmes. He said, we have shared the incommunicable experience of war. I think as well as any 21st contemporary historian, you have communicated the incommunicable experience of war. And you you weren't part of it. But I know you've done it. And as you need to, through the words of the participants. And so I I would say well done with that. I mean, that means obviously a great deal. That's the kind of thing you want to hear as an author. But yeah. I think that your framing of what you, your assessment of my book is really is spot on. And it's, you're actually pointing to what was one of the issues that made my editors uncomfortable. Because what they wanted this book to be was the first book that a person should read about the common soldier. I'd like to believe that that could still work yeah, for somebody. Why not? I think it could. Yeah. I think it could. I think that. I mean, I might still send someone, certainly Billings, I love that. I love Bell Wiley's book, The Life of Johnny Reb and Billy right. Yank, which, I mean, I draw from these individuals. Right. And so, I, it, it, in my attempt to bring all those layers of the soldier experience together, the level of complexity at times, you know, I, I can understand why that might be challenging to some to some readers, but... the case study narrative approach, I think, is what makes it accessible. Mm-hmm. And I think that one of my frustrations, and you all should speak to, to this as well, is that we're formulaic so much in how we write about the past. It's not just the Civil War. And we have a certain argument, and we are determined to, 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 um, to prove that argument. And there is a certainly value and merit to that. But there are times that that uh, 
mission to prove a thesis that I think at least for an artificiality, and I'd even go so far as to say that it's really not history at all. Because we have that formulaic, which is, okay, I have my idea, it's a topic sentence for a paragraph, and then you get a few quotes, and let's be honest, especially in this subject matter, you could make any generalization about a Civil War soldier, and you could what? You could go and you could find it. Right. right? It's right. out there yeah. some way, somewhere, right? You could, you'd be able to find it. Mm -hmm. And so what you often have in so much of the literature on the common soldier is the voice of the historian and then a few, again, well-chosen, juicy quotes that get the reader's attention, but it's so artificial. It's such a snapshot. So the case studies came down to one, I wanted to make sure I got men of all classes, and I did, and from the very poor to the rich. Right. I did that. Mm -hmm. And I got men from... Union and Confederate armies mm -hmm. from the East and from the West. But outside of that, what I wanted was a string of letters, meaning that I wanted letters over a sustained period of time so that the reader could see that there were many faces to being a soldier. Right. Right. How these men change. It's a it's it's never a state of being. It's always a process of becoming. Uh, and you say that in the book, don't you? Yeah, I yeah. do. Yeah. According um, to myself, that's and, pretty obnoxious. So, <laughs> <laughs> very obnoxious. Well, actually. no, but that's your point. <laughs> um, but so I, I will say this: yeah. that this is my first book that I've read about the common soldier oh, cool. because I'd yeah. never, until now, never really cared. I, yeah. I'm always more of the guy who's yeah. interested in the strategies of the generals yeah. and all that stuff. So to get this far down, yeah. I never really was interested in it. So I never read Hardtack and Coffee, although it is sitting on my table because yeah. I'm going to get to it someday. Yeah. So this is the first one and I'm loving it so far. I'm not yeah. finished with it, yeah. but I'm loving it because it's hitting on everything that I have wondered about the life for the common soldier um, in the, in the army. But there's something I noticed in the book. There, there's a lot of talk of God and I know we were a more religious society back then. Um, but but I, I'm trying I'm trying to discern. Are is there a lot of talk of God in here because um, they thought a lot about God and they talked a lot about God, or are are you a particularly religious person, or is that the, wh yeah. where, what's uh, where are we coming from here? Yeah, um, I'm not, I would say I'm particularly religious. I do go to a. Civil War Church in town, Christ Lutheran. Okay. So that's always an added bonus. There's a pattern. I lived in Richmond. I was Episcopal in Richmond because I wanted to sit in Robert E. Lee's pew, which I did in Richmond. So, yeah. Um, yeah anyone who studies Civil War America knows that, you know, um, on the North and the South, there is a, a sense, a conviction <clears throat> that God is ordering uh, daily affairs, earthly affairs. Uh, on behalf of his chosen people right. and that there's a certain order a certain direction a certain purpose that again that god's hand is behind and that metaphysical understanding of the world i think is safe to say is what most northerners and southerners what they believe coming into the conflict in 1861 mm. and that reference to providence as the war progresses as you can see there are all kinds of different expressions i think there's another safe generalization though to be made that no matter how pious a man was, if he was extraordinarily devout, like R.E. Lee, as someone like William becomes a Sherman, who is a deist at best, and that's on a good day, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I think that there still was what wars, of course, do. Is it created this great turmoil and this great confusion, not just in their physical world, but in their very understanding of how the world operated. And soldiering, as I came to appreciate, uh, especially for those on the ranks, right, on the ground, that that was extraordinarily traumatic because, one, things are not playing out in an orderly and predictable way. There's very hard to discern the hands of God, right? Mm -hmm. But then another important layer there's a sense of entrapment that these men felt that they they were not used to from their civilian life, right? Mm -hmm. They're told what to do and when to do it. And then on top of that is the inability to get information in any predictable and consistent and reliable way. Their world is surrounded by rumor. It's impossible for us, I think, to know that or to understand that. Unless maybe you go back to your college days in a dorm where right, everything is rumor. But for these men, it's extraordinarily frustrating, <laughs> right? To not know the truth when you came into the war believing that 
truth was attainable. I'll just very quickly give you a soldier quote, a guy named John Wiley, who came so frustrated that he wrote to his wife, shit, that's what he said, yeah. shit, I said, we can't believe anything around here. And, and so what I wanted people to get a sense of is that the instability of knowledge and the instability even within their spiritual lives did they all turn to deism or to deism? Did they all become atheists? And absolutely not. I didn't think if you ever gave up on God. I didn't find that. Right. But I found men who became providential pragmatists. There probably uh, were, but you were. didn't find. You, I didn't find them. Right. They weren't quick. On to the whole, they them. didn't give up on God. They didn't. They didn't. Which is amazing to me because, I mean, like, because what they're seeing is. So Bob and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, I correct me if I'm wrong. I see that generation as a lot more naive in many ways than we are today in certain and in, in certain ways we're very naive that they weren't naive and like bob said that you know that death was a very common thing for them and i said yes but not death where you're standing next to your friend and the next minute his head is off his shoulders yeah, yeah. and that's traumatizing death yeah. and you're doing this repeatedly for months or a yeah. year or two years or three or however long you're in this service for um how did they? How did they like yeah. handle all that so, stuff? Bob, do you think you're, do you think soldiers were naive? No, no, no. no, no. Going into it, I mean. Oh, I think you're probably right about that. Yeah, I don't mean yeah. because yeah. I mean like well, I, my example. In sen- I, I'm, I thought we were talking theological here. Na- no, no, no. Naive in the sense of they haven't seen the elephant. Correct. Right. So, they don't know. Now the explain for the newbies what that term means. They haven't experienced combat. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that's I, I my think, point. I think you have, though, an interesting idea, though, that we can see how these men continue to persevere. And I think that most of the existing scholarship books on this subject point to a lot of uh, very good reasons for that. I think a lot of it is the power of the ideas that this loss of life was uh, it was worth continuing the fight. And you could honor that loss of life of your comrades by doing the very thing that is so inexplicable to us. But I will quickly say, and what's a big part of this book, and another thing that my editors did not particularly care for, is coercion is a major part of Civil War armies. Mm. Bob, I'm curious, you and I have not had a chance, unfortunately, to get together. I hope we will after this. I, I get to meet a lot of the guides. In fact, they're going to come to my conference. Uh, we have a whole panel uh, the Battlefield Guides are going to be on. And I'm curious what you do on the battlefield because I've given a lot of tours and I often don't take about, I don't talk about the power of coercion. Mm. What I mean by that is that there is the real, not just threat, but the reality that if you don't keep your place in the ranks, that there will be at minimum a penalty of humiliation. Mm. To give you a quick example of one, in the Army of Tennessee, an officer who didn't do his part was forced to walk in front of the entire ranks front ranks of his regiment and as he walked by each soldier each soldier kicked him in the rear end <laughs> right <laughs> or they put a placard on a man that would read coward or of course let's not, you can only imagine how the grapevine of news made its way back to those communities yeah and then there's of course always the threat of execution which almost never happened for cowardice just for desertion my point being is this when we get on the battlefield to give these talks it's really easy to see these men as of a different age, and they were certainly very different from us. But they kept their place in that ranks for a variety of reasons. And the one reason or reasons that we often don't think of because they're invisible, but not to the men, it's coercion. Mm. It's coercion. How many times, Bob, I'm curious, do you ever have your group say, you know what, we're looking along lines of advance toward Pickett's Charge. Let's turn around and look into Spangler's Woods. What do you think you'd see there? Do you ever do that? Bob, have you ever done it? I do it all the time now. It's taken me a while. Yeah. I mean, we, as you know, and I, I, do you get battlefield tours too? Um, I've okay. taken friends and family yeah, around. Yeah, though. sure. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Man. It's yeah. that connection to the ground. Never and for the money. Yeah. Never for money. <laughs> Never for money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm always doing it I don't, for I don't have purposes. a license, I don't so I don't do it for money. <laughs> so, you know, fun. I have people turn around and look at Pickett's charge. What do you imagine? I, yeah. Not just yeah. the walking wounded. But you should also see enslaved people there. There are a lot of African Americans on this battlefield. You should see enslaved people. And you should also see what they called shirkers. Mm. Right? E.P. Alexander has a great example. The artillerist who orchestrated much of the bombardment on July the 3rd. And he saw two men rifling through what he thought was the possessions of a dead officer. He rode over to those two men. He said he was going to press charges against them. 
And they turned to him and they said, this man's not dead. He's our surgeon. And he does this before every battle. He gets drunk and we're taking his instruments, right? right? And there's a longer story to that in, in fighting for the Confederacy. But my point being is, and what I ask myself all the time, and Bob, I'm sure you all do this. What stories are told here? What are the stories that people want? And I'll tell you what they often want and what we too often give them are bedtime stories. Yeah. That's what they want. Yeah. And I absolutely have obvious strong reservations about that. I want to tell the stories of Pickett's Charge and those men who conform to that vision of Civil War heroism. I want to tell that story, but I also want to tell that story that Alexander related as well. Mm -hmm. they got to be side by side. And when we do that, we get the idealism or the naivete that you're mentioning, as well as the coercive forces, which I think are very much there. Well, I mean, it's a war is a human experience. Human beings are doing it, and not everybody's different, and they all handle things. It's a it's a horrible, uh, traumatic experience that most of us, thank God, haven't actually lived through. That's right. So how do we know how anybody would react? The fact that these people get up the next morning and stay there. So what if the guy gets drunk before a battle? I mean, it's better than blowing his head off. Well, you know, you're exactly right. The drinking that pervaded both armies during a fight is far more, I think, extensive than what we've ever imagined before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And again, none of that should surprise or shock us. But I had to come to this project again from a different angle, and I had to think about these men as letter writers, and that included thinking about their audience. And I'm not suggesting that these men misled the people back home, but they made choices as writers, and in so doing, there's silences in the text. And that's a better answer from one of your earlier questions, and, and that is this turn toward cultural history in which some would say, well, Pete, there's a silence. How do you interpret a silence? Well, I think you absolutely can interpret a silence. And I think the silences are deafening. I think that they're telling. And they reveal to us a great deal about what these men endured and what they and what they went through. Well, what, what, when you're saying uh, a silence, what, what do you mean by that? Right, right. So, again, here's a good example. Uh, both keep it to Gettysburg. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So, again, my advisor, Dr. Gallagher, is like a father to me, and we have differences, and that's to his credit early on. He said, we'll disagree, and that's perfectly fine. Uh Sure. And so he wrote, I think, a very important piece on Confederate reaction to Gettysburg. Okay. And in it, he makes the argument that for the vast majority of men in Lee's army, that certainly they looked upon what happened here as a defeat, but not something that was cataclysmic or devastating. In fact, many of these men, as he writes, and as he shows in the evidence, uh, these are men who, in fact, blame the Confederate reverse on the impregnable Union position, and then they immediately start to look for reasons as to why that they were actually victorious in the end, which is, of course, is just mind-boggling to us, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the reasons is that the federal army did not pursue aggressively. If, in fact, that army, the Union Army, uh, was uh, in a formidable condition, it would have, in fact, continued the uh, the attack, which mm. it did not. Mm. All right. So, look, I said to Dr. Gallagher, it doesn't conform to the reality. And Stephen Dotson Ramser's letters to his wife during the retreat speak of the retreat as basically a band of brothers that is still holding it together. There's no sense that this army was unraveling. And we know that for a fact. And so right. the question is... We have to move beyond just simply saying, well, this is a distortion that ramps are put forth. Why is he lying? Why is he deceiving? That doesn't get us anywhere. What we need to understand is the cultural lens that caused him to project or represent that experience the way he did. He is silencing the desertion that occurred, right? There's Mm, the silence. And he's doing it through the cultural lens of... Honor, among other things. But honor is critical here. Sure. Especially among Southern men who feel this great compulsion to be seen as always masters of their world. And so a defeat, a loss, especially to the Yankees, is a very difficult thing uh, for these, particularly Southern officers, I should add, Mm. for them to be able to write about and to accept. So it's the projection. So what I'm getting away from here is I, I don't, 
Dr. Gallagher would say to me, well, this is how he saw his world, end of story. And I would say, no, he saw his world this way, but then projected it on paper with a political purpose in mind. And that political purpose is, let's assure the folks back home that our prestige, it has not been in any way slighted slighted by what happened at Gettysburg. Does that make sense it's, what I'm Yeah, saying? it does. It's like yeah. McClaws after Brandy Station, I think he writes to his wife and he says something like, uh, you know, the Yankees weren't thrown back across the river. They retreated on their own, uh, at their own leisure. And right. I suppose they've accomplished what they've come over here for. But it's best we let the the lie prevail or right. something like that. <laughs> that's right. right. Yeah. That's right. Because, it, yes, Zipster was certainly embarrassed by what had happened. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. So, so the was wasn't kind to him about that. Those letters of Ramsour's were to his wife. That's right. Correct. N- N- Nelly? And so let me use that as a as a as a bridge, and I'm going to sure. quote something from from your book that when you, what, well, okay. Yeah. So the quote is um, visions of battlefield immortality, and this is from the first chapter. Uh, okay, yeah. filled the heads of Union and Confederate volunteers who breathed in the heavy air of sentimentalism. Mm. I like the point. I think the sentence is a bit much, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah. So, so what? What I want you to do is two things because it's two of the really, I think, strengths of the book. One is describing this cultural milieu that Mm -hmm. these men have come out of, both north and south. And so, I want you to explain a little bit what this sentimentalism, what that's like, but also the other strength of many in the book is. That constant looking back, Ram Sewer's writing to his wife, not right. to the politicians, right. because of some of that sentimentalism, right. if I'm not mistaken. So, so sentimentalism um, is a cultural lens that is the dominant one in the North and the South. And certainly it manifested itself in its own unique ways. But broadly speaking, sentimentalism is the, um, the belief that an individual can be the master of his circumstances and control those circumstances. And so if you want to get a sense for that idealism or that naivete that you spoke Mm -hmm. of, that's where it comes from. And it actually is a source of great optimism that the individual can accomplish and control. It's a, it's, it's the emotion is the emotion of cheerfulness. That's a key component of it. Right. The other part of sentimentalism is that the highest state of, uh, of that culture is to have character and to have character as a man in particular is to be pious is to show control and and self-restraint in terms of your emotions to be extraordinarily brave and of course to have a great love for not just for family but for nation all those things coming together on both sides is the cultural air that they breathed in it helps us understand the aspirations or expectations they had when the war began and of course as we know the reality of war dealt some heavy blows to sentimentalism and i would call them and i don't know if i use this language I hope I didn't because it sounds weird when I'm going about to say <laughs> right? Let's brace ourselves here. Hard, hardened sentimentalists, right? That's what they were. Uh-huh. I mean, they never, ever still lost that belief right. that the individual, right, could attain or could control one's environment. And let me be now very specific about it. Right? We go to Pickett's Charge and we ask ourselves time and time again, how could they do this, right? There are many explanations. We've already touched on some, but let's get to a very practical one. And that's the weaponry that Civil War armies used. And the weaponry, and there's again a lot of debate and conversation about the range of musketry fire during the Civil War. We know that it went all the way out to 500 yards. But I think we can all generally agree that most Civil War combat occurred 100 yards or less, usually Mm. around 75 yards. It was pretty quick and it was pretty decisive. That's an important point that everyone needs to hold on to because... You can, as a Civil War soldier, you can be audacious and you can be brave because for much of the time, that fire that's directed at you is going where? Over your head. It's going over your head. (laughs) Going over your head. So for those cultural aspirations to have their meaning, to have hold on a people, there has to be a reality in which they can practice it without annihilating themselves and i'm sure many of your listeners are saying good god almighty what does this guy know about the civil war because the body count is so incredibly high on so many different battlefields and that is true but it's also true that we can look at the war all the way to its bitter end 
April 2nd, 1865, outside Petersburg, and there are Union assaults, and they are attacking in formations that they deployed right here at Gettysburg. Now, they've evolved some, right. especially in the Sixth Corps and the Army of the Potomac. They're very creative in how they attack. But the point being, again, is the high ideas of sentimentalism, which you spoke of or quoted me from, you've got to get that. You've got to understand that, and you've got to know that it helped give these men a sense of purpose, and it gave the slaughter deep meaning deep meaning and yet and yet there's a practicality to this and the practicality is on this battlefield in which the weaponry allowed much of that to occur there'd be people who disagree with me about that scott hartwig i don't know if you've ever had scott here yeah we've got him on yeah it's kind of a different sort of take in describing civil war tactics he sees the formations as much looser instead of shoulder to shoulder Earl Hess is someone who I work, I value, as I do Scott's. I, you know, the bottom line is is that they did linear formations. I think when possible, they probably, those formations got a little bit loose, a little bit sure. more open. But, yeah. But, you know, those formations at the end of the day corresponded to them. The weaponry in which you could really only fire two times a minute. You could maybe go up to three, but it's mostly two. You got to concentrate firepower. The only way you can do that is close range. There yeah. you go. Right. Right. Iverson's attack on July 1st. Mm. There you have it, yeah. right? That, there's, that's a good example. Of that. So if, if you don't mind, let me, no, let me just... Press, yeah, press the, as much as the, you want. The book didn't go there, yeah. but this kind of sentimentalism will not survive worldwide two world wars in the 20th century. So uh, yes and no. I mean, it certainly survives, and, and I think even... <laughs> Vestiges of it get through World War One. I. I mean, there's although we focus on the, the lost generation and and you know just a handful of British poets. Certainly, there are plenty of survivors of World War One who still retain those beliefs that war makes a man and that the individual can't ultimately prevail. I think some of those assumptions still guide men into World War Two. But I think you're correct that after that we start to see it becoming. Uh, a little bit more diffuse, and that's maybe not even the right word. How about dilute, diluted? It's, it's, it doesn't have that same sort of adhesive hold on men. And again, I would in part say, because the weaponry has changed, and obviously I'm starting to speak out of turn here because my knowledge of modern warfare is extraordinarily limited, and and I can't even imagine how men and women today feel about their power to control and shape what occurs on a battlefield. I'd, right, yeah. I'd be interested in knowing that. Right? Well, and I'm no expert either, but it seems to me that uh, the Second World War in particular, a belief in the basic goodness of human nature is going to take a major hit yeah. from people like Hitler and yes. Stalin and right. so yeah. forth. Yeah. yeah, they yeah. really give human nature a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and don't you know, put, put Mao in there as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I'm teaching this semester. I have fantastic students at Gettysburg College. I really mm-hmm. enjoy them. And I'm teaching for the first time a class that I am uniquely unqualified to teach, uh, 20th century world history at the 100 level, right? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, and I, it's, it's not the best teaching I've ever done, but it's the most important teaching mm. because it affords me opportunities to talk about current events in ways that I am never partisan and I keep my opinions back as much as I can. But to bring back to your point about Stalin, Hitler and Mao, throw him in and probably threw a few others. Mussolini. Uh, yeah, you throw Mussolini as well. Yeah. Man, our century, the 19th century, is child's play yeah. compared to this. Right. And it's... Uh, and that's, that's that goes to the, uh, my point about them being a little more naive. I mean, I think... Because what was it? Thirty miles from home. That's about. The, nobody really went further than that in their lifetime. And here they're off in different states on the same continent. Right. But still, it's it's a whole different world to them. And they're they're. Yeah. Let's talk about. Yeah. You, I, I just want to. Yeah. That's a really good point. I think we all need to get to remind ourselves of how Civil War soldiers, and they acknowledged it, had entered what they believe was, they didn't use the word alien, but it was, it felt very alien to them to be within a military environment. Now they Mm. grew accustomed to it. Some never did. I was struck by how many truly pious soldiers, right, who really retained their faith throughout their service, found camp uh, to be so unsettling. And what they particularly found unsettling were the sounds and the noises. Mm. That's that they, they read my mind because I was going to go to camp. Of men singing, that, that singing that really, really did get to them, right? And you can't escape that. Yeah. You can avert your eye, 
But it's hard to write unless you put cotton in your ears or yeah. something like that. And I even guess, then, right? you can still hear things. Still hear yeah, things. That's right. Your your ears can never, right. you can never close <laughs> off your ears enough. No, but that's, so you taught, you bring up camp then. Yeah. So let's get into that because that's something, um, wh- you have to leave at 45, right? I have a, a, yeah, no, I'm good. Okay, you're good. I, I have class at 2.30 and okay. we're going actually to... Little Round Top with my students. All right. Nice. Uh, with Chris Gwynn. Have you had oh, Chris yeah. on? Oh, yeah. He's coming yeah. on next week. Yeah. He's fantastic. And a Gettysburg alum. I tell him, yeah. tell him when you see him, say, I just did Matt's show and it's the best time you'll it's ever great. have. They were both, they, <laughs> they were sober, which we're rather surprised by. <laughs> yeah. But we won't be. You, don't, you obviously don't know the two of us. <laughs> That's right. One of us is a bit of a teetotaler. <laughs> more, I've got my mind more in the mid 19th century than. Um, <laughs> the Wait, who's the teetotaler? Totally, me or you? I'm more the. T- oh, are you kidding me? Well, I- <laughs> <laughs> did you have to ask that question? Well, I cut down a lot. <laughs> uh, okay, no. So the g- camp. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is something people always want to know about. They're fascinated by this stuff, and it, and it is kind. It kind of I get in like a Freudian way. It's like a, the toilet phase of uh, that we never really get out of. People want to know. Like you, you talk about how. First of all, did we get the term "caught with your pants down" from the Civil War? I, I don't know. I've never. <laughs> Yeah. Well, because you 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 use it in here. I don't know if you use it or if it's in a quote, but you're talking about camp and how people would just drop trow and go anywhere, and they'd have to be careful not to get caught with their pants down. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if that's where that comes from, because yeah. they always like you know the yeah. whole nine yards yeah. comes I don't out know of where it comes from. Yeah, if, if I put that in there, I was if, not. A, yeah, if where, you can ask that question, I'm going to ask mine. Yeah, well, wait, hold on, I'm not done with stupid <laughs> questions. No, so so, uh, but talk about a little bit about sanitation in yeah. the camp life and, and how just men behave because let's remember these are young men yeah they're men yeah uh, we're disgusting <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> and and so what what is it and I don't want to get prurient in any way or anything right. like that but also like s- uh, sexually like what yeah. are these guys right. how are they getting their releases these they're in the prime right. of their life and they're right. they're in this situation right. what's it all like tell me so I think this goes back to my earlier observation about these they're letter writers, and they're writing for an audience. And so that, of course, leads them to make certain decisions as to what they will include and what they won't mm-hmm. include. And there are and certain soldiers, especially those who are not well-educated, who are either semi-literate or illiterate, and it's those men who will write very graphically about especially issues of sanitation, about the lack of cleanliness, and about the, thinking now of a Louisiana soldier uh, Trans Mississippi, who wrote in his diary time and time again about how the men would just defecate wherever they pleased. And of course, that's early in the war. They came again. Here's pragmatism for you, right? They started to recognize that, hey, wait, this is really unhealthy and people are getting sick and maybe there's a connection here, uh-huh. right? So, <clears throat> but military discipline does kick in. And so, even though they're volunteers and see themselves as citizen soldiers, it's in time, again, back to Oliver Wendell Holmes. The importance of professionalism, and it's not just on the battlefield, it's in camp as well. And so that discipline and that order and that control, which is critical, you look at any camp um, regulation that um, you can see how the, the, the tents are supposed to be organized, right, 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 right. right? And where the enlistment men are and where the, where the officers are. I mean, if you have any interest in Foucault... And anyone who says they understand Foucault, I hope you never have them on this show I, because they're lying to you. I've never heard. What are you saying? Foucault. You know Foucault. No, I don't. If, if you've heard Foucault Do before, I? look you, Foucault. You mean feng shui? You mean a philosopher? <laughs> Fushai, Fushai. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Fou, I mean, Foucault's all about, when he looks at prisons, about the oh, degree of observation. He's that, a philosopher? Right? He is yeah. a philosopher. How do you spell look at it? Foucault. F O U C A U L T. I think so. I think I nailed that. Yeah. Listen, there's not any Foucault in my book anyway. I, I'm just saying <laughs> there's but Foucault's great contribution is about power and about also about crime and punishment he's deeply interested in. Oh, humanistic and social scientific disciplines. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go ahead. He is absolutely unreadable. And like I said, anyone who says, Oh, I really get him, I've read him, they're lying uh-huh. to you. Yeah. But there are people who've got good insights from him. Okay. And my point being here is that when you look at the regulations as to how tense our camps were to be organized, right? You see again that there is a need for surveillance and supervision. There's right. your coercion at work so that these problems that you are discussing, those problems of sanitation, that if the officers, you know, if they are or if they are good officers, they're competent, they're conscientious, they're making certain 
right? That that stuff doesn't go on because they understand that it's jeopardizing the health of their men. Mm. Now, the the sexual stuff, it, it, I would recommend Judy Giesberg's book. It's a very thin volume. It's about pornography and Civil War soldiers. Is it G- called Stories the Soldiers Wouldn't Tell? Yeah, that's okay, right. I lied. This is yeah. the second book about right. the common soldier I read. Yeah, yeah. that was the that's first one. <laughs> <laughs> the one with pictures. Yeah. 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 No, because the, so, and, and that's that is an interesting. I recommend so wait, that I might, too. Yeah, so it's Giesberg. We might have got the titles confused here. Oh. The story the soldiers wouldn't tell is Thomas Lowry. Oh he yes, wrote that. that is correct. That's right, and that's very anecdotal and quite good. Lowry was a great researcher, but it, and then Giesberg did something a little bit recently and looked at the campaign against pornography and that story is rooted within the Civil War and it continues into the post-war period. The point being is, yeah, of course, man, these guys had access to sure, pornography right. and, 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 I women. Just, and women and there's a great set of letters and boy, I wish I'd had it for this book of an Illinois couple. Uh, they're called the Standards, their last names. William Standard is his name and Jane is hers and the book's published by Kent State and I'll get you the title here. It'll come to me in just a little bit. He writes very openly and very graphically. And she even writes back, ask, how many men get the clap? She wanted yeah. to know. He wrote, he described Louisville. This is his words, not mine. He said, Louisville's nothing but a big whorehouse. <laughs> and then he writes about other men. He says, and I think he's doing all this to sort of make himself look better in right, his wife's right. eyes. Uh-huh. And these other men that are going off and seeing prostitutes. And he names them. He names names, which is highly <laughs> unusual. Right? Right? What's that, bro code? Yeah. No, What's bro code pretty, in the Civil War? But right. this guy didn't have it. And... uh and I'm going to get the title of that book before this is on. It yeah. begins with an so, I. I'm going to, so oh. before you came, Dr. Pete, can I call you Dr. You just Pete? Just call me Pete. Because be one great. of the co-hosts yeah. sometimes is Pete. And yeah, this Pete's is, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. But anyway, um, before you came, we were expressing, we didn't use these words, but I am now, how we're glad your book wasn't a scratch and sniff. Because when you, <laughs> <laughs> when you were describing uh, that camp at Corinth where it's they're defecating place. all over oh the place, God, we can horrible. almost smell it that's thanks to horrible. the descriptive that's, powers. Yeah, that's but, horrible. But let me ask, because this was the stupid question that I was going to get. Remember I said, let me ask a question if you're going to go there? Yeah. Mine was going to be, I thought, really trivial and stupid, too. But it's so exactly I, wait, 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 what do you mean, this? too? Like mine was? <laughs> yes, <That's right>. it was. <laughs> <laughs> so before you ask it, I'm going to throw in the title because of my oh, people okay. mind. Infernal War. In- uh, Infernal I, War. I cannot say enough good things about that okay. book. Again, an Illinois couple. You read her letters as well as his. Infernal War. It's about two years old. Uh, published by Kent State. You can get it on Amazon. See, I love to hear this stuff, though, it's because stuff. the same thing with stories the soldiers wouldn't tell. And we'll get to you in a second, Bob. The well, same thing with stories. Wait, 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 because I, I want to just finish this up so we move on to yours. Uh, but the stories the soldiers wouldn't tell, uh, what I loved about it was uh, seeing that these people who up, up until that point I had in my head this these stoic because if you always see them in the pictures they're very stoic looking very boring looking people no smiles or anything um and and then you see the letter that that one one chaplain was writing to a, a whore and he's drawing <laughs> pictures of his, his phallus penis, yeah. and and uh, and the word yeah. the f word in yeah, there and yeah. everything and I'm like Wow, these people were they just were, like us, <laughs> but, but but they hid it better. It's like a lie through omission, which I guess is kind of what you're talking about with the silence, right? Yeah, it's lying right. through omission. Yeah, that's right. And so the, the, I love that. I can't yeah. wait to read this now because I like to see that these people are normal people yeah. like there's, the rest of us. There's a, a great, and then we'll get to a question. I'll be there fishing with this. Uh, <laughs> just stay in the corner. There's, there's a, there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fictional account of World War One written by a man who served in the trenches. His name's Henry Barbus. It's called Under Fire. It's uh-huh. a great book. I love it. Assign it to my students, in fact. And in Barbus at the very beginning, uh, again, he's taking his his experiences at the front, but he creates these fictional characters. Right. And this man asks him, are you going to put in the cuss words? And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And the man says, well, then you're not telling the true story of what, what, what went on. There, there you go. Right? So, yeah, there is a yeah. lot of self-editing there as well. And uh, you bring up cuss words. Again, sorry, Bob, one second, because <laughs> um, uh, cuss words, you say there, there's that one quote uh, where the guy starts off, oh, shit, uh, you know. Um, what Do you know, like, have you come across other cuss words oh that we God. still use today? Uh, yeah, I've seen, the, well, I saw the F word used in a, and this is a very serious matter here, this was a, a, a rape case. Um, they asked the woman before Blake, "Did he f you?" Really? And, uh, it, like yeah. what? Like in? They're they're at they, a court martial. Yeah, court martial. And they, the guys were convicted and executed uh, outside Petersburg. And so the question was, "Did he f you?" Uh-huh. 
That's interesting. That, now, I've seen other, I have a number of cases. In fact, it's Tom Lowry who did the book on yeah. it. He just did incredible stuff in going through court martial records. And so because of his hard work, I was able to do key, keyword searches, right? Uh. I didn't do the F search. <laughs> it doesn't get that kind of keyword. But I did. I wanted to look at, at issues of rape. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, because that had to be... Uh... There, there, there were. Uh, not as many as you would think. And it's, there's some interesting work being done on that crystal uh, feister or feister at yale is doing a book on sexual violence during the war hmm. um <laughs> going back to pornography so you're gonna have the highest listenership of any podcast because we're talking about <laughs> the f word and sex. Sex. <laughs> my kids listen to this yeah. they were so eager to hear me on the radio right <laughs> so um this this will go from the ridiculous to potentially the sublime because i'm gonna ask, work in two questions then to segue okay um so this is silly i know yeah. but there used to be an example of Civil War pornography in the Gettysburg Visitor Center. I don't believe it's in the new Visitor Center. No, it's and not. So, sure it's so not. my question for you is, is that a loss? Absolutely. Of course it is. Yeah, no. I mean, none of these things. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll hit this uh, from a no, number of angles in terms of the, the rough uh, language that they deployed. Um, the standards, the, the Illinois couple that I mentioned. They were again were very graphic. In fact, she he writes a letter, and I'm I'm gonna I'm I'll edit one word out. He was upset that his brother-in-law didn't mention him in a letter. He's really angry, so he wrote back to his wife, and he said, "You know, he doesn't care enough about me. He can kiss." My, and I'm quoting him. I remember this quote: "He can kiss my black ass, and if my ass isn't black enough, I'll bring him a in winch from down south, and he can kiss her ass." <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, so then now some other letters. John Foster, who um, I wish I could tell you the title, published by a family member. They're very well done. John Foster, it's, I think 118th Pennsylvania. It's a Zoop regiment on Little Round Top. You know the Zoop regiment that yeah. has a monument that the monument's like the arms broken or something. You mean the 150? So, okay, good. Fifth good. On Little Round Top? Yes. The 118th of the Corn Exchange. Oh, of course. What am I so, saying? Okay. What am I saying? That's not the 118th. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, where does the Zoop regiment again on Little Round Top? 155th. Okay, so he's in, he's in that. Yeah. In fact, he gets wounded at, at Little Round Top, John Foster, right? Okay. Yeah. And uh, his letters are the most graphic I've ever read. Really? Oh, my God. He tells his wife how she should masturbate. Really? Like he should know. Where but, do you find these? So this is, they. I just bought them in hell. They're just, they're self-published. You bought them? They bought the, they're published. John Foster, you can look them on Amazon. And I, I, I'm i sorry, I don't know the title, but we've got the regiment again. Say the regiment again. 155th. Yeah. He yeah. then goes on. He's so open that even prior to the Overland campaign, he's telling his wife, he's angry at his captain. He feels like he's not getting promoted properly and he's refusing to carry a musket he said in the next battle i'm going to desert and he did just that uh, and then he writes from washington dc he's hiding out and and i it's in the book i, I hate it when people say that kind of thing yeah, yeah but you know. you're, you're not doing it as a tease you're just not, yeah not, not um all right you mentioned desertion hey, hey hey what i got two questions remember you owe it to me the ridiculous oh. to the sublime sorry oh, we didn't get although that's not ridiculous. okay okay all right. all right and i want to get this in because i know Pete better now. <laughs> <laughs> the opening chapter, yeah. the opening description is of a painting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Was that perhaps, I could, as I was reading that, I could see you as a teenager maybe, maybe younger, looking at that picture and with that analytical mind, which I now know better, <laughs> Wondering, what are those guys thinking? Why are they sitting apart from each other? Um, um, th this painting is in front of Yorktown. Yeah. It's a, probably yeah. the most famous painting from Civil War soldiering experience. Buy the book and you can see it, what it looks like. Yeah. But anyway, um, did that painting draw you into an interest in this subject? Yeah. Like you draw, use it to draw our interest into the book, into the lives of the men? So surprisingly, it did not. I came to that painting very late. I don't even know where I saw it for the first time. I was so taken by, and you can it pulled up. It's so, uh, so odd. Can we get the right title? It's in front of Yorktown. Is that the title? Yeah, uh, yeah in front of Yorktown. yeah, in front of Yorktown. And it's uh, and and we can get the artist in there as Winslow well. Homer, Winslow Homer. Did I say that? I'm yeah. sorry, Winslow, Winslow Homer, Homer in front yeah. of Yorktown. I wasn't sure if you had or not. 
I love Winslow Homer. Who doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, his war stuff is so compelling. And I love his seascapes after the war. So I don't know where I came across it, but I found it was so unusual in comparison to some of his other work, except there's always this great ambiguity with Holmes, right? Mm-hmm. right? Or uh, Homer. Winslow Homer, excuse me. Winslow mm-hmm. Homer, there's this great ambiguity. And when you look at that painting, what's so odd is that at the very center of the painting is a big tree. It's yeah. a massive tree. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then there's this fire and on one side there are a few enlisted men who are huddled together and then there's this sense of isolation and an officer on the other side of the fire pit and the tree of course enhances that sense of divide and and what that painting did for me is that it conveyed that sense of physical intimacy and emotional intimacy the closeness right that we all know pervaded the ranks and yet there are these great tensions that existed and it's not just between officers and enlisted men well that certainly was the case and so I was, that's what I was taken by. That's what I was consumed by. That's what my editors didn't particularly like. They believe, and others do as well, that this book emphasizes what's called the dark turn in the Civil War. And we could talk a little bit about that. I think it's an interesting sort of subject. But the point of the dark turn is that it's not all heroic. It's not triumphant. I think we've acknowledged that a very long time ago, and that wasn't the point of what I was trying to do. I simply wanted to say that Civil War soldiery couldn't be this, or it couldn't be that, meaning you couldn't just say, hey, it's a band of brothers, nor could you say, hey, man, they're at each other's throats because there's all this class tension. There were moments there were all of those things. And that painting, I thought, like all of Homer's work, it captures that ambiguity. Like, I love... The, the painting of Petersburg, I don't It's not called the crater. I don't think it is. Right when the Confederate, that defiant he's rebel, standing he's up above standing the trenches. up, right? Mm-hmm. But then there's that enslaved person who's almost a caricature <laughs> who's got the big smile thinking, what's that crazy white boy doing, <laughs> right? 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 Yep. But I think it's his amazing. Yeah. like, you're dying for what? <laughs> right? What, what yeah, are you right. doing here? Right? So I love that artwork. I mean, you know, I think what got me going in this business, and probably for you all as well. It's coming here as a kid. Yeah. You know, my mom and dad, they have uh, they did so much for me. And it's hard for me almost not to even get choked up and my dad's mm. no longer with me anymore. Right. And my dad was a, a Korean War veteran. And my dad screamed out in the middle of the night a lot. He never mm. talked about it. Mm. And, and he'd give you little snippets, right? Right. But he could come here, right? And, and he wasn't very well educated. He barely had a high school degree. But the history here was powerful to him. I, he connected to it. My mom connected to yeah. it, right? Awesome. And so I think for all of us, right, it's the yeah. power of this place, right? Mm-hmm. It's and it's this something place. about this place, because I, I grew up, before I ever came here, right. I grew up going to Virginia battlefields. Yes. Yeah. And that was always fun. Yeah. Those are cool. Yeah. But when I came here, I, I came here on a field trip. I grew up in New Jersey. Yeah. came here on a field trip. It was a day trip. Yeah. And I got home and I said to my dad, I'm like, dad, we have to go back there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. every summer we came for a weekend yeah. Yeah. and I finally moved here. Like I, I had, I, had there's something when I'm not yeah. here, I'm unhappy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I think it goes to the importance of what Bob does. Yeah. Right? Right. Connecting people, connecting young people and a reminder to all of us, young people care a great deal about the past. Mm-hmm. Vast numbers of our young people never get access to this place. And it, Within our own county, we have a Latino mm. community within our county, and I'm just going to be very blunt here, who deserve to go to that visitor center as all poor people do, free. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, charging poor people fifteen dollars oh. to come. You know, we're always talking about, and this is we racialize these things, and it drives me yeah. nuts. Black people don't come to the battlefield. Well, hey, here's an idea: uh, people in Baltimore will take that community. Most of these are working people. They might get two weeks off a year. Right. You, you want them to come up and spend their money on this? Oh, come on, let's right. stop racializing these saints and let's make this battlefield truly accessible. That visitor center needs to have gradations in terms of price points. We poor people need to be able to come here. And I, I'm just saying yeah. what he does is so important, right? And, and And we cannot give up on young people, as I hear, the cynicism that pervades this country is absolutely dangerous. So dangerous. Towards the youth. Yeah, and towards everything. Well, towards everything, yeah. Every politician is corrupt. They don't care about us. You know well, what? Well, that's true. That's that not true. true. <laughs> it's absolutely not true. We have a reminder every day 
the fragility of a democracy. And a mm. democracy is at great risk when you lose faith in the institutions and the people that govern them. Yeah. We should not lose our cynicism, or excuse me, our, our critical eye. I, I, we all right. in agreement, but we need to stop this nonsense, right? And the, and the language that we now deploy in which we talk about the other political side, I mean, I'll just say it. We should not have a president who speaks the way he speaks. Uh, and I'm not, listen, I'm a t- hardcore moderate, but I believe in civility and respect. That's what I believe in. And, and we should demand that from everybody. Right. And we should remind ourselves again, come here, remind yourself this place where the union was saved and got throw emancipation in there as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. It's a powerful place. Right. It's a powerful place. It is. It, you might be encouraged to know that some of us are doing that. I know you I, are. I'm at Absolutely. the peace light yeah. and I'm, I'm sharing the, the prayer of the veterans yes. for peace united yeah. or, or peace eternal and a yeah. nation united. Yeah. And I'll just say, and boy, don't we need that now. Yeah, absolutely. And through the course of the tour, introducing individual soldiers like yeah. Jeremiah Gage yeah. or Alonzo Cushing, both yeah. 22 years old, both yeah. will die here. Yeah. And say, isn't it sad that we got to a point in our country's history that we could not work out a compromise right. anymore because we had demonized mm-hmm. each other right. in the years before and we had used words. And I, I'll say, I don't care what side of the political divide you're on. That's right. If this war was fought today, there would be perhaps seven and a half million since our population mm. is more than 10 yeah, times yeah, the size yeah, dead. So yeah. look at what happens yeah. when we don't treat each other as yeah. fellow human beings and respect. I, I think you have such a good point about the collapse of the two party system and mm. the and the the failure ultimately to reach compromise. But I want to throw something out just for us to think about. I'm not saying okay. I'm right, I'm not saying I'm wrong. I tell my students, I'm glad, I'm glad that there wasn't a compromise reached after Lincoln's election. I'm glad because everyone prior to Lincoln kept kicking the can, Mm -hmm. right, when it came to slavery and the expansion into the territories. And why I'm glad they didn't compromise, because when I think about the situation of an enslaved person in 1860, Mm -hmm. you want to tell that enslaved person, hey, we compromised this thing. (laughs) It's not going to be your generation, maybe the next, or maybe the one after it, right? And so I'll say to people that, any war and the sacrifice of life is a great tragedy. And for those who come out of it, I'm going to state the obvious. They don't come out the other side the same people. No. However, I do believe that there are times when organized killing is necessary. I think this is one of those times. I agree. And, and, and it's easy for me and my dad to say, with. Right. Hell, man, you weren't even in Boy Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't shoot yeah. straight with a BB gun. What are you talking about? Right. 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 I, I understand you, to think you put very narrow parameters around that compromise period once Lincoln was elected. Right. So the Crittenden compromise at the end. Yeah. But I I go back to the breakdown even earlier. Yes, I agree. To, to after the revolution or during the revolution, Pennsylvania is able to find a way to free their slaves. Yeah. It's a it's a gradual yeah, emancipation, right. but we did it without bloodshed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm fearful of now. I see parallels between America today, not so much north and south, although interestingly it is in some regards. Right. It's more urban rural, right, it's urban, more right. Republican, right. Democrat, left, right, urban, urban rural. rural, right, left, right, right. But the way we choose our words and we demonize each other and we don't realize that that is a fellow American, right. that's what I what I rail against and, and worry yeah. about. Yeah. Now. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have to, I mean, when I was a kid, so around seventies, eighties, right. Mm-hmm. We had three, three channels. Which my children were like, what? How, how, did, you <laughs> how did you survive? So, so I was teaching yeah. high school kids when yeah. in the seventies and eighties. So just to <laughs> let you know how old I am. <laughs> so, 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 so three, three networks, right. Yeah. And now we have, we oh. have Fox and MSNBC. And if you, and I do, I watch them all. Yeah. And then I'm of course disgusted by them all. But they're two different realities, and absolutely. And I don't want to put too much responsibility on them, but I will. In fact, they're you both should. in their own ways irresponsible. Yeah. they mm-hmm. both are irresponsible. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's. I, I saw my students, The Economist, which is a British 
magazine mm-hmm. it's right to center so they can't charge me with being some weenie liberal, liberal academic. yeah yeah it's to the right of central and center and it's british right right and because i don't think that they can get objective news from either msnbc no. or from fox and they need to find it but, Br- but britain's uh media is all corporate it, owned too it is but they kind of you ever read the economist it's yeah, it's, I've read it's, articles. it's i mean it's i think and look i don't want to come across as this guy who reads you know <laughs> <laughs> Freud, which I right. don't, right? right? Or Foucault. He knows I Foucault. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know Foucault now, right? Yeah. right. I, I don't. And even with The Economist, like, I read, but much of it is like over me. But right. still, right. it gives you a global perspective that yeah. is useful. And if I'm being honest, I said I, I've read a couple articles of the Economist. I actually just have read the word Economist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. I, let's be honest here, um, real quick, and then because sure, we're running for time, and, time and then do, yeah. I, I want to get the listeners' questions in for them. Oh, yeah, so go ahead, Bob. One more. Oh, can I? Yeah, of um, course. The first soldier you're introduced to us, and in, in the introduction is John Partington. He says on page two in the book. Um, something about the war wanting the war to be quote done satisfactory to both parties the end of the war uh-huh. and i'm just wondering if that was done yeah that's a really big and important question mm-hmm. and again because it ties uh, into today yeah absolutely and again, bob I'm, I'm again i hope we get a chance to talk after this i really mm-hmm. enjoyed it and and as well it's you're you're asking the right questions and it's good to know that those are being asked on the battlefield and i would say this is that with any historical event, it never ends in a tidy way. Mm. And often we want that to happen so that we can then say, well, the causes of the Civil War and the consequences, well, if we wrap it all together, we can see that, you know what? This wasn't some waste of life. Or the politicians didn't blunder in the 1850s. And in fact, you know, there were real issues at mm. stake here. And so I will say that the war did end on a satisfactory note. First, the union preserved. The question of secession, no more. Mm. No one's going to raise that again, and they did not. The second issue, slavery's dead, period. Now, look, there are new forms of coercion that emerged in the South. Everyone knows it from right? Jim Crow, mm-hmm. disfranchisement. However, you cannot buy and sell a black body again. Any. Body. And then you have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that come out of it. That price in blood, I think, I think, in fact, had a revolutionary impact in the moment. It's true. There's some yeah, rollback. Sure. But hell, that's like any historical Ooh, moment. Right. Yes. But it set the foundation for what I believe is the second. I don't think the first American Revolution was much of a revolution. <laughs> first Revolution, Civil War. Second Revolution, Civil so rights struggle. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so, yes, I believe it was resolved. Yeah. Satisfactory. A dream deferred, but nevertheless, a yes. dream that can be realized. Absolutely. Before. And we should note John Partington buried in our national cemetery in an unknown grave. John oh, Partington, right. really? a that's man right. who loved the Union so much, though originally from England, loved the Union so much that when he looked at the flag, he wrote to his wife and said that he fought for this country because it embodied the things that he treasured more more dearly, dearly right. than anything else. And that, of course, that was, was great. his wife. Next time oh. I'm in the cemetery and I... I talk about it every tour and go there often yeah. but there's another thing i'm going to bring out thanks to your book what was happening on november 19th 1863 in south carolina yeah. to william walker uh, we don't have time to get into all that yeah. but i was so but you just have to get the book so yeah. very get the book he's, yeah. a, he's a usct soldier we can tell box soldier yeah, yeah it's tragic tragic yeah. who's tragic. executed Executed. Well, now you just gave it away. Now, why are they going to get the book? Well, they need to know why he got (laughs) executed. Okay, all right. There's more to the story. (laughs) (laughs) Full full teaser. (laughs) And I'd love to talk to you more about... We're we're definitely going to do this, man. That's fantastic. The African-American experience. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And there's there's so much more to this. Um, uh, I could literally have you here for four hours. So we're going to have to do this more often, okay? All right. Consider yourself a regular then. Um, Well, I hope you all come to the Civil War Institute Conference. I know you have a lot of equipment here, but I I'd love for you all to come over to the college and interview some of our speakers. I think I would really kill to do that. Yeah. When, so when is that? Yeah. When is so that we're again? the second weekend of June, and oh. the second weekend of June we begin on a Friday night. But then Saturday and Sunday is the core of the conference, where we have the speakers, we have breakout sessions, we have concurrent sessions. Yeah. Meaning, there's a lot of choice. It's not just battlefield stuff, although it's some of that. It's home front. 
We have a session on Mary Lincoln. I mean, it's just it, no. Well, we could do that. Or, or we'd love for you to yeah. come. Yeah, yeah. I would love to do we'd that. Set and you and up we can in the Cub. Oh, that'd and, be great. Yeah. I no, we, we could, and we can totally make this portable. Yeah. I have a portable one oh, to do it. So okay. that would be perfect. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, by the way. All right, so right here we got some questions. Sure. Sure. Um, every time I have a guest on, I ask my Instagram users to. Uh, Ask some questions. So here we go. Ex girlfriend, any ex girlfriends, right? Yeah, all of them actually all are ex girlfriends. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's right. Right, right. Here's the first one, Matt. Why did you leave me? <laughs> no. Uh, okay, Central Virginia historian on Instagram. He says North and South. What were the personal motivations that caused men to enlist? So we kind of touched on this a little bit, but like, was there? They're so extremely varied that it is hard, of course, to identify one thing. But we can go to where I think people are most comfortable, and that's simply to say that for a Southern soldier, it was defense of home. And I would quickly add, though, what did defense of home embody? It's a range of things. Right. And what is woven through that society is the institution of slavery. And it is for Northern soldiers, it is the abstraction in 1861 of union. And that cause for union, as I've already mentioned, becomes a cause of Union and emancipation, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, um, and also... That's the simple, easy answer. <laughs> also to impress a girl. You know what? There's a big part of that. There's financial yeah. reasons as well. I mean, there's just a whole host of things. Mm -hmm. One of the most, I think, compelling books about why Southern men fought called All That Makes the Man by Stephen Barry. I have a massive man crush on him. He teaches <laughs> at the University of Georgia. He writes beautifully. Stephen Barry, he wrote a book on the Todds. He also oversaw a site that you two would, and your listeners would enjoy. It's a website called Private Voices. Okay. Private Voices. It's filled with the writings of illiterate and semi-literate Confederate soldiers. And the best news, all the letters are transcribed. They're all typed out. Oh, nice. You don't have to, read <laughs> don't have to look at them. Private Voices. Stephen uh. Barry, University of Georgia. Fantastic scholar. No relation to Chuck? I doubt it. Okay. <laughs> He's pretty... Seizure as wide as they come. <laughs> okay. All right. Grant underscore Delavalle from Instagram wonders, since most Americans didn't travel beyond 30 miles from home, what were some of the most... Uh, what were some of the common ways soldiers coped with the new way of living and homesickness? In particular, how did they spend the holidays? I guess because Christmas is coming Christmas up. Christmas is coming. Well, I'm going to give you a book. Ready? Catherine, Sh how do you spell Meyer Shively? Catherine with a K. I think I'm right about that. And it's called Nature's Civil War. She's dating a guy up here who lives in Gettysburg. He's a historian down in Fredericksburg. If she comes up to town, you guys got to interview her. Okay. She teaches history at Virginia Commonwealth University. She did her PhD at UVA. She's writing a biography at Jubal Early. Her book, Nature's Civil War, answers. Your listener's question. He, she outlines the range of coping strategies from straggling, which we often see as a lack of discipline, but for her and her eye, and she's right, it's a way to survive. It's how these men interacted with the environment because they came to see that the environment was a uh, pretty tough customer. That's yeah. exactly right. For the holidays, men, they are in winter quarters. And so it was a time in which these men often would be overcome by melancholy because they lived in physical dwellings that very much resembled home because that's how they that's decorated. What, right, right. They would refer to each other as their better halves. I mean, it was yeah. you know, some joking way of getting through it all. But yet, they're all struggling, and no surprise here, with what they called the blues. The blues. And there's one of the great ironies of the war, right? Both sides fighting for home, fighting for family. It's a source of patriotism and inspiration. There's your sentimentalism. Mm -hmm. But it's also the Achilles heel. It's what makes you want to throw down that musket and get the hell out and get back home. Mm. Yeah, Nature's Civil War, Katie Meyer. She's fantastic. Right. She'd be great. She'd be All great. right, cool. Uh, okay, another one. Grant D on Instagram. No relation to the previous questioner, or is there? Uh, he asks, how did the soldiers react to seeing their friends die? Are there any examples of long-term effects of seeing this on any survivors? I guess he means, uh, you know, like what we call PTSD today or anything like that. But, I mean... To talk to that though. These you you grew up with these kids. You enlisted. Yeah. Maybe this is your cousin, your yeah. brother. And you're yeah. marching into battle, yeah. and yeah. he's gone. That's right. 
So I read this uh, at an archive at Duke University last spring. It was Pickett's Charge and a Confederate survivor writing Comrade's wife. It broke my heart. He said, I had to leave him on the field. He begged me. And he's writing about having to walk away and abandon a man that he feared that either would die from the wound or he's going to fall into enemy hands. Mm. And so that emotional loss uh, was something that these men wrote about in very open ways, expressive ways. And I don't know how you handle this on the battlefield when you're giving your tours, but I used to sort of describe these men as emotionally tough and hardened. But in fact, the emotional bond and connection they had surprised them that they felt more strongly toward these comrades than they often did for family members. And what surprised me is they wrote to their women folk about this. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, uh, words are all they had. And they often said that that was not enough to be able to convey that sense of loss that they felt, particularly when they had, and you can just imagine this, right? Having to leave a wounded comrade, yeah. abandon your friend, right? Knowing God knows what would happen to that mm -hmm. person. I just read last night, I'm sure you've read it a million times. I read Chamberlain's uh, piece on Little Round Top for the Hearst Magazine. Mm -hmm. It's very long and it's very graphic and powerful. It's romantic right. about war. Yeah. And then he writes right after the fighting at Little Round Top, and I'm going to go there in just a little bit. And I'm going to look at those rocks differently now. He writes about how these men, as they sort of scattered after the fighting ended, some of them curling up to these rocks, some of them seeking shelter, they're all just sort of in a daze. Mm. It just makes that landscape now sort of come alive. Yeah. So that sort of speaks again to this as well. It's like like almost like the reverting to being little yeah. boys, yeah. children. Yeah. Like yeah. it's so traumatizing yeah. that yeah. it's how you deal with things. Oh, he, he, I think even Chamberlain, in a different report, he said... You know, you can imagine these men collapsing to the ground out of exhaustion. I believe I'm correct. He wrote, they fell asleep. Yeah. I've read, that exhausted yeah. just completely wow. passed out, fell asleep. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm sorry. I love Chamberlain. I'm tired of the backlash against him. Yeah. Okay. After the war, he had a little bit of an ego problem. Okay. So right, what? So what? <laughs> so what? Yeah. Because you know what Chamberlain did? Every governor is, does. <laughs> what is truly astonishing about Chamberlain's career, in my mind, it's not Little Round Top. It's what he did during the final two weeks of the war. Mm. What he did at Lewis Farmhouse, White Oak Road, that preceded Five Forks, all three of those fights in which he is the point of the spear in many cases for these Fifth Corps assaults. Right. It's truly remarkable. People don't care about that because it's not Gettysburg. Right, right. I have a little issue with that. I, I grew up as an interpreter working in the National Park Service in Virginia. Oh. I started at Appomattox. Oh, and cool. It's been almost my entire career at Fredericksburg. So I have a the Central a Virginia there. historian who well, I uh, well, asked the question well, from. Is. He's from uh, there Appomattox. There um, all right. So uh, Jason Trinetti, 45, he says, Dr. Carmichael runs a Civil War Institute I'm trying to get into this summer. If you can slip it in, tell him that I'm a big fan of his and mention my name. Now, so, is Jason a, Trinetti. Jason, we will do all we can. Is he a high school student? He is. I think he's a senior or yeah. a junior in high school, yeah. and uh, he loves this place. He's actually, his grandparents brought him down for one of the events that we put on all over right. the summer, um, cleaning them the monuments. Hey, uh, tell and, Jason we have a scholarship program, and I'd love for him to apply. We have go. about 12 high school kids we bring in every year. All right. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then finally, Anastasia Jacobi oh. says, oh. Hi. If you could time travel, what period would you go to? Well, I think she's referring to within the Civil War. And no, any, any, so. oh, no, any period any at all. Oh, well, of course, it's going to be the Civil War. I'll Naturally. be very specific about the yeah. moment. It is um, when the Confederate Army in Northern Virginia retreated across the Potomac River after Antietam, in mm. which there's reserve artillery uh, on the banks on the Virginia side and the Federals, including now, I'll get it right here, the 118th Pennsylvania, the Corn Exchange Range of it. I made, I made up for that mistake. <laughs> right? They cross right, and it's ba barely a beachhead. But William Nelson Pendleton, the chief of artillery for Lee's Army, a man who was better preacher than he was yeah. an artillerist, he scurried from the scene. It's pitch black, wakes Robert E. Lee up and says to Lee, all the reserve artillery has been captured. And Lee says, all of it? He says, all of it. 
I want that moment. I want to see Lee's face. That's what I want. So, that's, so a that's a great answer. Yeah. That's a great yeah. answer. I like that. Dr. Pete, this was a real thrill Pete. for me. I got to yeah. let you go. Hey, all right, man. Pete. Sorry, yeah, Pete. Yeah. Thank you very much for doing this. And uh, thank you to all the Patreon listeners for listening. And we'll talk to you next that's time. Great. Thank you. All right. That was great. Listen, hey, thanks, I, yeah. Awesome. Could yeah, you give me a I favor? I so enjoyed it, yeah. Could've My friend... Uh, yeah. She asked if you, if you would sign this book. Absolutely. Okay. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. Her name is Veronica. Veronica. Now let's make sure I have been notorious for misspelling. Well, V-E-R.